Welcome to the Veterinary Project Podcast, episode 070. Welcome to the show created by vets featuring absolutely no pets. This is the Veterinary Project Podcast, hosted by Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light. Our resident veterinarians have swapped out their stethoscopes in favor of microphones to bring you the Veterinary Project Podcast, a show focused on real conversations aimed to connect this amazing profession full of remarkable people. Through the sharing of collective stories and wisdom and connecting over the many unique challenges we face, we invite you to join our community of veterinary professionals leading intentional lives. And now, here are the hosts of the Veterinary Project Podcast, Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light. Welcome back to the final episode, 2021 of the Veterinary Project Podcast. You have yours truly, Dr. Jonathan Light and Dr. Michael Bug. You're all smiles, buddy. Feeling it? I am. I am. I love your intros. And this was, this was a great episode. This was a lot of fun. I think we recorded this on a Monday night. And to have a drink, have a rum and eggnog with the group of people that was there, like it, the final word that I would have to sum it up is I was very encouraged. You know, at the end of that evening, I was like, wow, this the is a cool, cool group. The whole process to get this together has literally reignited some excitement for me within veterinary medicine. There has been some difficulties in 2021 and to have the eight of us round table, a couple of drinks going into different wormholes. It was very enjoyable. And I think there's going to be for everyone listening, some key nugget there that you're going to jump into. Uh, and I, yeah, I really enjoyed it great way to finish off the year i don't know who thought about it originally but uh hey yeah it's it's pretty, one of those things it's proud all... to be a part of it going you know we both said it what do we do it as part of this group <laughs> well i mean and honestly i sat there silent for a good chunk of it because i was like holy man like there is a lot of like deep thinkers here and it's like i'm not i'm not stepping in front of like there's just so much coming out of them so many good ideas um and, you know, not a lot of alignment, obviously, in terms of everyone wants the profession and the people in the profession and the pets that we serve to do well. Yes. But at points where there was differing opinions or just slightly different perspectives, like very agreeable and like, okay, well, how can we take all these multiple angles, put them together and just be better as a whole and as a community? And that, that is just so cool to be a part of out of any episode we've done in the last year and a half and literally to the end of December, 20, uh, 20, the, to the end of December, 2021, Mike, we've recorded each and every week this year. Kudos to us. Yeah. And our guests and our listeners, Doug, our producer, Ruben, Dan, the man from invested talents. We couldn't have done it without you guys at all. I'm most excited about this episode getting it out to the, the public and our listeners and seeing what comes from it for the exact yeah. reasons that you mentioned. Yeah. I try not to stop too long and pat myself on the back and, and obviously you as well, but it's like that episode every week, that one, I am going to stop and be like, cause I had that on our goal list. I remember when we were coming into the year, it was a lot of work, man. So good job, great job. And you know, it, it is fun. And if you keep showing up, I was texting with Gary Marshall, one of our, our guests on this episode after the episode. And I was, I was just saying like, man, like, I'm just honored to have met you because, because he's a new addition. His episode hasn't even come out yet. It's coming out in 2022. One of the kindest men I think I've ever met. And he texted me back and he said, I'm sticky. You won't be able to get rid of me now. <laughs> and I was just laughing and I was like, but that's what it takes, you know, is it the is. people that'll just keep yep. showing up, even if you get knocked down and there's more challenges, just show up every day, every week. So that's probably as the podcast goes, that's the thing I'm most proud of this year was that 52 episodes went out. So good job, Jonathan. Vice versa, Mike, we wouldn't have done it without you. You held me to the fire multiple times where I was getting down and out or too busy in quotations with other things that's on you we wouldn't have got 52 episodes without you buddy pushing it along okay well thank yep. you and thank you to our listeners and 
And anyway, that's enough of that. That's enough patting ourselves on the back. This episode was fantastic. We're not done. There's episodes coming out in 2022, but I think this might have to become an annual thing because it was, it was great. We are going to make it an annual thing. I'm calling it already for our current listeners or, or I mean, our current uh, inaugural guests who, as the list goes for our guests today that we have joining us, we have Dr. Tanisha Crocker on Instagram. You find her at dr.tanisha, T-A-N-N-E-T-J-E dot Crocker. K-R-O-C-K-E-R. Then we have Dr. Craig Mosley. We had Dr. Jordan Woodsworth on Instagram at Jord underscore Marie 306. We had Dr. Kent Weir, our very first uh, guest on the podcast. He's at at K-Dog, D-A-W-K 306, sweet name. Then we had Dr. Gary Marshall at it.might.get.weird. And then finally, Dr. Steph Van Dynes, you can find her on Instagram at dr.stephanie underscore Van Dynes underscore Snell. This is a really exciting podcast. We get into it. A couple of key themes that we talk about are the current state of veterinary medicine in 2021. What are some views on where the future of the veterinary industry profession goes? Where do we sit on that? And then a really fun topic and an important one is what can one person or group do to make an impact in our profession. And then there's a whole bunch of rabbit holes in between. Enjoy this podcast. Without further ado, our roundtable. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Veterinary Project Podcast. We are so excited that you are all able to join us tonight. Thank you very much. On this podcast, for those that may not know, we have Dr. Michael Bug, Dr. Jordan, Myself, Dr. Craig Mosley, Dr. Kent, Dr. Tanisha, Dr. Steph, and Dr. Gary Marshall. This is a long time coming, something that we wanted to put together. And without uh, further ado, because the intro is already gone into all of our individual speakers, how's everybody doing tonight? Feeling relaxed? A drink beside you? What are some of the drinks that are happening for our inaugural 2021 roundtable? Just classic rum and eggnog. I am anti, anti-eggnog, so I'm sticking to the wine tonight. Sticking to the wine. Kent, what's going on over there? I got some bamboo, uh, bamboo rum, which is my new favorite rum. Uh, and you can never go wrong with eggnog. So, Do you say bamboo? Bamboo? Bamboo rum, yeah. Where do you find that? Uh, everywhere, I think. Nice. <laughs> I don't know. White Minster oh. has it everywhere. This is both on audio and video, and Kent has shown us the bottle. So for those that, like me, may not recognize what the bamboo is, you now know what the bottle looks like, at least. Mm -hmm. Dr. Gary Marshall, what is happening in your corner? You are late to the event. This is not late, really. You came right on time, but you've got a special cocktail in the making tonight. Yeah, we've got uh, a little Woodenville rye. Um, It's local down here in Washington State. And a lot of different little things in here. We got some little Russian pine cone things and boozy cherries and orange and, uh, and some bitters. So kind of a, a holiday old fashioned. Excellent. Holiday old fashioned. Tasting it, making it look good. Steph, back at the clinic, keeping away yeah. from the kids for a little while. What's happening there? You showed this us a bottle. The, yeah, this is the first time I've been drinking in the clinic. I found this in our liquor cabinet because we hardly drink anymore. So what a great excuse. Thanks, guys. I think there's some people on the panel that already don't believe you, Steph. (laughs) Oh, goodness. I know I was trying to think. I'm like, when is the last time we had drinks? And it's probably a couple of years with you, John. And like, Mike, I think it was my and Dave's wedding. What was the last time? Right? I think so. It's been a while. It's been a long time. How can you even call yourself Canadian? (laughs) Uh, oh goodness i don't know it's been gary, a rough 10 years, gary. Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> and then craig you have a drink as well too i do i have the classic rum and eggnog but the spice rum spice which adds rum just a little bit of zip yes well there's a reason we're sporting drinks tonight and there's a reason that we've all come together tonight and it's on purpose This has been a difficult year. It's been a difficult couple years if you consider COVID and all the changes that have happened in veterinary medicine. 
Mike and I in thinking about how we could finish 2021 strong, which has been a, 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 a year of growth for us within the veterinary project and community that has come together. Uh, we really wanted to bring together uh, what we would consider thought leaders individuals that are working in different areas of veterinary medicine to discuss some really uh, both difficult topics, but then at the same point, looking ahead to what we think is also positive for all of the things that are happening in veterinary medicine. And as opposed to just Mike and I droning on about it in our positive ways, etc. Let's have a discussion and, and chat and hopefully have some differing opinions and see what rabbit holes we could go down. So one of the first questions that we want to start off on this roundtable this evening, uh, which is very broad and can go in many different directions, is to get some thoughts from our roundtable uh, participants on the current state of veterinary medicine in 2021. Where are we in 2021? And I don't want to go any further because then I'll be given biases away. So who wants to take this first one on? as a start to the conversation, to their views on the state of veterinary medicine in 2021. Craig, you were first up with the hand. Start us off. Sure. No, I appreciate it. Um, you know, it's interesting because I feel like um, 2021 has just been an acceleration of some of the trends that we've been seeing, you know, probably over the last five to 10 years, actually, in our profession. And and I'll be honest, you know, I, I'm actually pretty excited about where we're heading. Yes, I get it. We're in some really tough times. We're in a transition and the profession needed to go through some kind of a transition. And I think that, you know, I, it's not necessarily the pandemic. It's just the pressures that have been put on us, you know, again, sort of because of the pandemic, but these things were going to happen. We knew we, this was going to happen. We we're going to have a crush. And so I actually see this as being a really positive and, and a really you know, it's tough right now, but I think on the other side of this, we're going to see a lot of really creative solutions to the problems that we're facing as a profession. And so I'm actually really excited about that. And, you know, I, again, I could go on, but in, in, the, in the essence of being succinct, I think to me, I'm very optimistic about the future. I'm really excited about it. I think we're going to see a lot of positive things happen and we're going to actually see change, which sadly our profession has not really been the most willing to change. Um, and so I think it's actually really good. Um, but there's been some revelations and I'll save that till later, but there's been some things I've definitely learned over this pandemic that have changed the way I think about things. Thank you, Craig. So then you're speaking about it from a current transition in that place. And we're going to go to the future in a further question. Tanisha, you had your hand up. Where does that match up into your view of current state of veterinary medicine? I would agree with Craig uh, in regards to the transition. And I think that our, our cracks and our struggles have really been shown in veterinary medicine, but we've also been shown uh, how much one opportunity there is and how much people really buy into our profession and how needed we are. And that in itself really allows us to um, diversify and niche down and really cater to pet owners in a different way. I think the generational trends with millennial pet owners is really interesting. And as someone who loves pet owners and loves to educate and interact with them, I think there's a really awesome opportunity there to help a lot of people and their pets going forward. And in general, the next generation of, of veterinary students and veterinary professionals are really outspoken about what they expect, the value that they think uh, they need. And I think it is really pushing us that have been in the profession for a while to really examine what we're doing, what our work-life balance is like, what does wellness really mean? What can we offer employees? And I think those are great questions. I think I am just tired of people talking about it and I want to see differences and I wanna see change. And I'm excited about this panel because it is a group of people who have said, we still love this profession and we've chosen different paths and different routes, but we still have a passion for it and we still believe in what we do and we still love helping people and pets. And so I think that if anything, I have a lot of hope going forward. And I'm excited about it, which might be a different perspective than a lot of people, but um, it's been a tough, tough year. I've struggled more than I have in the past. And I don't think we can negate that, but I think there's a lot of uh, promise too. Interesting points you raise, uh, cater to pet 
vets owners in a different way. We're a needed profession, next generation of vet students being outspoken. I want to focus this conversation if I can on the current, because we're going to go to the future and the next steps. So speaking the current state of veterinary medicine, Gary, as a person on the ground in practice as of two hours ago, what's your view? Yeah, um, I, I love all this. This is great. And I'm, I'm really ha happy to be here. And the first thing I wrote down when, when I heard that question is that um, kind of, I think, I think we're kind of a little bit at a fork in the road. Um, as the only baby boomer on this panel, there's, there's, uh, there's been a little bit this year as kind of the state of the profession as far as out with the old and bring on the new with the millennials and Gen Z and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really, really great. And I think at this fork in the road, I think some of us old timers are going to say, you know, screw this, I'm getting out because this is horrible. Yep. And then there's going to be some of us that feel like, um, I, I, I like this change. We need to make this change. And um, I think the current state is this fork in the road like so many people have already talked about is um, I think our business has really, really been uh, client centric, patient centric for a long time at the expense of ourselves and our employees and our teams. And it's, it worked for quite a long time, but it's not working anymore. And so we need to make that, 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 that shift. Um, um, and I'm looking forward to, it. and I think we're at that shift in a, in wellness and focusing on our on our employees and our people and and making that work for both because I don't know how it's going to work for both yeah. both all Always. the clients patients and our staffs. Excellent. Anybody with a differing view on Gary's current state? Kent, I think he's got a couple of comments. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I don't know if I would say that I have a, a different. different view necessarily. Um, and I guess I guess I kind of like that both Gary and Craig have brought up kind of two sides of the thing. I mean, I, I guess this past four, three and a half years, I've been on the Saskatchewan Veterinary Medical Association. Uh, so we are the governing body uh, for veterinary, med veterinary medicine in Saskatchewan. Uh, and I feel like from the uh, from from that organization, and I'm not speaking on behalf of them right now, So, uh, but uh, as someone who sat on that, uh, I feel this fork in the road. And that has been stressful for us as an organization because I think there's a lot of demand right now for us to change the way veterinary medicine is, is offered and the way that we're allowed to practice veterinary medicine. Yeah. And I think that's where we're really going to like really come up against some walls is because there's a lot of stuff up top that needs to change before. And, and I don't even know what changes, you know, Gary uh, and Craig are talking about necessarily, but I have my own ideas of where I think changes can happen. And I mean, that comes with letting RVTs do more, um, you know, that type of thing. And I think, uh, just how we're allowed to do telemedicine. And th these are really presenting some major issues for us as a Saskatchewan Veterinary Medical Association. Uh, how, do we, how do we approach this? And so I like that uh, Gary describes it as a fork in the road because that's probably more so how I feel. But I'm happy to hear that Craig feels hopeful about it because uh, I think for me, where I'm at right now, I really feel like I'm at that fork and it's like, I, I don't know. I, I think that the associations are struggling with how to move forward uh, right now. That's the state I feel right now. Thank you, Kent. Thanks for sharing. And Craig, I think you have a point in, in addition, and then we'll jump to Steph as well, too. This is a great start. Yeah, sorry. I just, I really, it just resonates with me, like um, Gary's comments about the fork in the road and Kent, you know, because I'm actually one of those people who feels that fork in the road, too. I mean, when I started practicing, it was a very different type of practice than what it is now. You know, the way that we practice now is not the same as when I started practice. When I started practice, it was sort of that James Harriet thing. And I had great relationships with my clients, really tight, close. You know, I did, I did all my procedures in front of my clients, obviously, because we didn't have as many technicians and I was a large animal vet. And I know I can see uh, um, Tanya talking yep. about this as well. Um, there, I, Cause I know Veg does this, but, but I think that, there's been a, that for some of us has been really, really hard. And when the pandemic hit and I heard doctors saying and staff saying, oh, I'm so glad that clients aren't yeah. in the building. This is so nice. It killed me a little bit inside. And I'm an anesthesiologist and I still love clients. I still think of all the people that I serve in the hospital as my clients and I do everything for them. But when I hear that, it's just, I don't know, that's, that's the core of what we do. We are a service industry. And at the end of the day, the dog doesn't come into the clinic on its own. 
a client brings it in. And that's who we have to be receptive to and responsive to, but not at the detriment of our own personal well-being and our own personal health. And so I think there does have to be some guidelines and some guardrails set around that. But I think as an older veterinarian, I really feel that. And I, and I, you know, I talk about it a lot, but I was grieving the profession because it's not the same as what it was when I started. And I miss that in some ways, but I'm also really optimistic about where we're heading. Thank you. Is it guardrails that is allow us, that's going to allow us to move forward without the pendulum continuing to swing all the way to the other side? Because right now, as you've described Craig properly, I have veterinarians that don't want to see clients again. I have veterinarians that are not veterinarians, excuse me. I have complete teams. And this is, this is outside of my group that I work with, inside of my group that I work with that truthfully feel that burnout feeling. And as a result of it, every excuse possible is made for why XYZ shouldn't be back in the building. That's difficult, especially when we are a service industry. And we are. And anybody that says different, I, I also have concerns with too. Steph, you want to bring a comment? Yes. Yeah. So my comment is basically um, right now there is all kinds of things happening within our industry. And when you guys talk about like a fork in the road, the way I see it, it's actually more like, like if I could sum it up in hand, in like a hand motion, it's like, like this right now, like there's just stuff everywhere. Like, like when that you is look a through scribbled any... line on a piece of paper <laughs> all over the place for anybody yes, that like... not, maybe not be watching. Yeah, so if I had to sum up the year 2021 with hand motions, that's what it would look like. So basically, I really think um, there is the opportunity for really anyone to do anything right now. Like when we talk about how there are some veterinarians that don't want to see clients again, like there are some clients that don't really necessarily want to actually see us again either, right? So, so I don't think the biggest thing that I saw in 2021 21 was just like all these different perspectives right because everyone is so different and everyone wants different things and I think there's room for all of that but but I what I saw this past year was a lot of like well no we need to do this or oh no we need to do this and then I saw you know there's lots of people like well we need boundaries we need wellness and and it's just kind of all over the place so like how do we bring together those ideas and really looking into the future I think like like I know we're not onto that 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 topic yet, like the future, but um, but I do think like it's like how can we all appreciate each other's perspectives and see where there's room for each of us, you know, kind of within the profession, and you know, really not necessarily to the detriment of the client because there's clients out there too that um, that you know there there's a niche for each one of them them as well. Yep. So that's yep. kind of yeah, like I do think 2021 like when we look at what is change management, right? And it's basically like the first phase is that storm, it's storming, right? And then it's the norming and then you start performing. So I really think that was 2021 is we're just storming around right now. It's kind of how I see it. Yeah. Jordan and Mike, last two on the panel, comments, perspectives on the current state in 2021. So I guess from my perspective, I've got, you know, a lot of, I, I echo a lot of what's been said already, but I, I, I really agree with that fork in the road feeling. I definitely, uh, I definitely see that. And I definitely see these huge opportunities for change, both in how we do business as a profession, um, how we, how we reach people, um, especially, you know, in states of chaos, like we've kind of been in for the last couple of years, but, but, you know, what sorts of things does that, does that leave us open to, right? How can we change what we do in order to manage risk when these types of things are potentially on the horizon at any point in time? Um, I hope we don't have another pandemic anytime soon, but <laughs> in case we do, we've got loads of opportunity to learn from this. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so things like that, everybody's been talking about the ways that we manage ourselves and our teams um, and our relationships with clients. And, and Steph, you mentioned boundaries, and I, I kind of wrote that down because I think that that actually is a really huge part of this. And I'm, you know, t not, t not just talking boundaries as far as, you know, how we allow um, our relationships with clients to happen, uh, but also how we allow our relationships within our teams to happen and how we have boundaries within our teams um, and how we have boundaries within our, you know, between our family life and our home life and our work life and all of those different things, right? I think all of those things are really important. Um, 
And so I too have a lot of hope and, and actually excitement for where this profession is going. And I'm excited to talk about the future in a little bit here. Um, but in terms of, you know, what steps we can take moving forward to sort of start to remodel this profession, to be something that serves more people in a better way. Um, and stuff you talked about, or somebody talked about all the little niches, right? The room that we have for everybody, not just in, you know, the people who practice veterinary medicine, but also the people who utilize veterinary medicine as a service. Um, and I think that uh, there's lots of lots of like I mean the the bound or the yeah the the limits are endless I would say in terms of what we could potentially do with this because um, we've done the same thing for a lot of years and I think now's the time to switch it up. Well, let's jump down there. Let's go down that rabbit hole because there are so many ideas out in industry right now about what's possible and what the future of veterinary medicine looks like. I'm going to try and keep us on track here, but I would love to gather some input on some of your individual views of where that can happen. And I also want to throw this out here. Um, corporate medicine exists, and I'm speaking specifically to North America, US and Canada in particular. How does that impact the future of veterinary medicine? And also something that I think Kent nailed on, whether it's in the US or Canada, is regulation pertaining to the practice of veterinary medicine. Sit on the EBVMA Council, I'm not speaking directly on results, but the same thing. We're, we're, in, in, we're, we're stuck in that stressful period right now where to serve and protect the public, also the needs of veterinary medicine, we're stuck right now. And, and that's a difficult place to be in. So I'd love to get people's perspective to the future state of veterinary medicine in 2022 and beyond. Who wants to start on that one? Gary, first up. I'd like to, as part of that, I'd like to tie into something you were just bringing up as far as like associations. And I wanted to say it when Kent, um, uh, Kent men, uh, mentioned uh, his association there with, um, with his group. And as a past president of our Washington State VMA and as a current delegate uh, in the House de Delegates for the AVMA, I think that's a fascinating thing to, to look at because where these associations are amazing and nobody really knows like from outside of those what they've done for our profession over the last 50 years and it's 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 really really um garnered just a huge um huge benefit for all of us and just what like when you talk about this corporate medicine stuff who, who's who are our members and who are we serving because as we go forward these corporations are going to be paying for each individual's memberships. And so for them to pay for getting these members on boards to get these benefits from these organizations and to build up these organizations with their capital, we've got to cater to the corporations. And that's a whole, Stephanie's like this thing going on with the hands circling around. It's kind of a whole other thing about where we go in the future for that and organized veterinary medicine and advocacy and who are we catering to? Will we be catering to our individual veterinarians or will, be, will we be catering to the huge corporations that, that employ all these veterinarians? And that's the only thing I wanted to bring in to tie into that and I'll let other people talk. I appreciate that, Gary. And that gave myself a headache thinking about on the whole left here of the hours and hours of debate that will ensue based on that question alone. Jordan, you had a point that you wanted to bring up. So I'm just going to expand on what Gary was talking about in terms of who we serve um, as, as, you know, what you're talking about from a regulatory standpoint, but I'm also thinking of who we serve as a profession generally. Um, and I think that, you know, one of the things that, that, I have learned throughout this pandemic is that, again, as I said, there are endless opportunities for the ways that we could go in terms of how we provide service. And so whether that's telemedicine, telehealth, or numerous other things, right, partnering with paraprofessionals in order to provide service where we, you know, outside of our lane, or in regions where we don't necessarily provide service currently, um, we all take an oath to uh, protect the health and welfare of animals everywhere. And um, I think I mentioned this in my episode with you guys, but I think we're doing kind of a shit job of that, right? Right now, generally speaking, in this profession, right, there's a whole bunch of animals who are never served by veterinarians. Um, and so their welfare and their health suffer as a result. And we know that the health and welfare of animals is very tightly tied to the health and welfare of their human counterparts. So where we can improve the health and well-being of our animals, we can definitely improve the health and well-being of humans and communities. And so what I see is um, also a lot of potential in terms of steps forward for how we talk about the importance of, of 
animal health care, um, how we talk about who provides that and under what circumstances is it reasonable for folks other than veterinarians to provide that, um, and how we expand our boundaries a little bit um, in order to ensure that that care is provided in the absence of veterinary care. Um, and so I think that there's some really, you know, some big critical thinking that needs to happen on for the profession at large in terms of, um, you know, where we where we end and where lay service begins. Um, and I'm going to probably get some flack for that. <laughs> um, but uh, but, you know, there's lots of lots of ways that we could promote health and well-being of animals and communities uh, in places that are currently not having real great health and welfare of, of animals, certainly, um, with a little bit of creative thinking and creative, uh, creative service provision. So fantastic. Jordan, I love the perspective you brought forward. And, and that perspective uh, is also shared in, in the context of also veterinary shortages as an overall in, in our support professionals, etc. So it's a, such a, 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 it's not a new focus, but an important focus. Craig, definitely know you want to jump in on this as well. Yeah, yeah. So um, just a couple of one couple of things that came up in some of that discussion. One is about the regulators and their role in the profession, because one of the things I've observed in different provinces and states is that the licensing body and the advocacy group on behalf of the veterinarian is the same organization, yeah. which to me, there's somewhat of an inherent conflict in my mind anyway on that. Now, you know, the province I practice in currently, we have a college of veterinarians which is purely the public protection piece and who license veterinarians. And then we have our VMA and their only job is to advocate on behalf of veterinarians. And the thing I sometimes worry about is the, 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 um, the demands of those two groups could be different. And when I listen to Jordan, who I feel very strongly the same, like we have to solve this problem about access to care. Like to me, it is crazy that in our profession, we're eliminating a huge segment of the population from ever accessing our care because we won't offer them something that is equitable with where they can meet us. And I sometimes feel like, oh, so no care is better than, you know, good care or okay care. And so, you know, I do sometimes worry about that, that relationship and some of the regulatory bodies being one and of the same, but I agree with Jordan largely, like we do need to fix that problem. And I'm not opposed to having our paraprofessionals um, involved in that. And in fact, I'm a huge advocate for our paraprofessionals. You want to talk about the future of this profession? I think the future of this profession is going to rest largely on our paraprofessionals if we will empower them to do the work that they can do under our supervision. Um, you know, as veterinarians, I just worry that if we're not part of this, we will just watch this happen around us as veterinarians, and then we're going to cry foul. And I, I, that's my biggest concern. We have to be part of this chain. So I want to get specific on this. Let's get into the mud. What do you mean? And I want other people to jump in when you say the use and utilization of paraprofessionals, what does that look like to you, Craig, in 2022? And then we'll jump into others. You know what, listen, if, if you look at all the regulatory bodies, for most part, the only thing a technician cannot do under my supervision is they cannot prescribe, they cannot diagnose, they cannot do surgery, and they cannot prognosticate. There's an awful lot of stuff that doesn't require prognostication, surgery, diagnosis, or prescribing that they can do. And if they do a physical exam on a patient and find an abnormality, well, then I can come in and diagnose it, you know, um, same as we do with nurse practitioners and so forth. So to me, I, I already, I think we could utilize them more, you know, and I used to talk a lot about nurse practitioners and the importance of nurse practitioners. And then I started talking to some of our nurse colleagues and they're like, well, actually, you just need to use us up to the potential of our license actually first, and then we can talk about nurse practitioners. So I do think that to me, that's a big stumbling block. And a lot of it is fear on our, our behalf. Like as veterinarians, oh, we're afraid. Like, oh, it's our license. And this is, you know what? These are, these are professionals. Like these are great, talented, highly skilled individuals. And we need to empower them. We're losing them at a, a grossly terrible rate right now in our profession. And it, it's, yeah, I, I could go on and on on this topic. I get very passionate about it. I'm very sorry. I'll no, stop for good. a moment. But I'm going to jump in though. 
because I want to get Kent's perspective from a mixed animal practice. Craig, thank you very much. And I, I put you on the spot and I knew where you're going to go down and it's great because it's going to get us broaden more conversation. Kent, you're in a mixed animal practice in what would be considered in North America still a smaller center. How do you see this playing out in your practice and, and beyond within you know the greater community where I'm, my guess and it's a pure assumption is that you could use more support overall? Yeah, I mean, my, my clinic's pretty special in the fact that uh, Leominster is a very good oil town. Um, and so I don't know how to say this in a, I don't know, but a lot of uh, women end up following their husband or a spouse for a good job in the oil. Uh, and they're looking looking to work in my clinic because they're here. They don't move here for, for their job, which is sad. And I can go on a whole thing about paying RBTs because I'm very passionate about paying RBTs. I wanted, way, yep. I wanted like somebody way, to go there. Um, so that's something that I've been working on in my own practice. Uh, but I think, you know, where... I, I mean, I'm all for it, John, honestly. I mean, if my dad was sitting here right now, him and I are, are um, I won't say at odds on this, but we definitely have different opinions okay. on this part of it. And I really think that RBTs should be, um, I, I guess I have a lot of, a lot of specific examples, um, but I guess where, where my brain goes is that there are people out there, um, we have equine dentists, right? They, they have some training, not great training, but I mean, I say, why not? why not say we accept these three schools of econ dentistry and they're allowed to do it in our province now because we can't keep up to it. I don't want to flow horses teeth all day. I mean, yeah. I would hold on to the things I like doing. Like I love pregnancy diagnosis in, in cattle. So I would do that all day, every day if you let me, um, but could somebody else do it? Yes. Do I want to semen test bulls for the rest of my life? No, I don't want my <laughs> clients to hear me say that, but like, Absolutely. I, it's not my thing. So I'm like, right now I'm like, we are getting texts out doing bulls this year because because we can't. I'll sit there, I'll be on my phone doing other stuff. Like I can be there if they need to be. Like they can do most of it on their own, right? So um, in mixed animal practice, I do think you're going to find a lot more maybe old school veterinarians who are a bit more reluctant to that change. Uh, but I, I, I personally, as a young 40 year old veterinarian, uh, think that... Uh, I think, I think there's a lot of opportunity there to let paraprofessionals do a lot of the job that, that we just don't have the time to do. Excellent. Thank you, Kent. Let's stay on this paraprofessionals because it seems like from both head nods, people raising their hands, this is a big part of our future. Tanisha, a couple comments on this one. So, okay, I'm going to wrap in the corporate thing and the paraprofessional thing because we are doing it at Veterinary Emergency Group. When you join us as a support staff member and not a doctor, there is no ceiling. You can do anything in our corporation. And I was a person, I was like a diehard, I will never work for a corporation, private practice, equine girl originally, like it, never, never going to sell out. I'm using quotations for those of you not watching to a corporation. But then I experienced what veterinary emergency group is doing, and they are doing exactly what you guys are saying. I am diagnosing and I am letting my amazing, amazing emergency veterinary technicians or RVTs do as much as possible in the ER because I am busy and I do not need to be doing all the hands-on things. I don't pass nasogastric tubes. Um, they do all the technical work, like all of it. They help unblock cats. They help suturing the catheters. They obviously place all the catheters, do all the treatments. I can do more with amazing technicians than I can even with another ER doctor in the hospital. And the fact that other veterinarians don't understand this, and Jonathan, we've talked about this and there's very specific statistics. If you just have another amazing support staff member as a veterinarian, how much you can do revenue wise versus just having another doctor in the building, but not having support staff. So I do think it is a shift in uh, the way they're thinking. I think large animal and equine, a lot of the older generation hates the competition. Like I used to have to do 50% on call because my boss was scared about us losing clients if we shared on call with the local equine vets. It was ridiculous. People loved us. They would use somebody else for emergency. Occasionally we would have had better work-life balance. 
but he wasn't willing to consider it. But I do think there's value in, in what the next generation is, is wanting out of veterinary medicine and what they are willing to, uh, to try. And I 100% would say we are already doing it at Veterinary Emergency Group. We utilize support staff. We, we encourage education. We have free CE. They, they increase their skill set, which increases their value to us. So we pay them very, very well. And to me, it's, it's logical. And for so many smart people in our profession, and I'm being super direct here, I don't understand how people don't get it. it Excellent. I, I don't. But a portion of this and, and is both regulation, tradition, and time and evolution. And so, Gary, I'm going to leave the last comment to you before we move to next. And, and I want to continue on the, the positive move in 2022, switch in direction a little away from paraprofessionals, because I think we could spend an hour there alone. Yeah, I um, uh, when I raised my hand a few people ago, it was um, when Craig was talking about access to care, because um, these, again, as the old timer in the group, um, these um, new... Um, ways that we incorporate the paraprofessionals, it's fantastic. And to, but to make the best use of that, like Tanasia has wisely said, is we need to pay people. We need to get mm -hmm. them in there. We need to honor them. We need to um, uh, uh, value them in for what they bring. And it pays huge dividends. Um, to do that, I don't know if the rest of you have seen it, whether you're taking your own pet to the vet or whether you're you're taking care of um, large animals, small animals, the bills were shown to clients are so much bigger. Um, it kind of blows me away. And as Craig has said, you know, e whether it's gold standard or whether it's just, you know, getting some lab work and figuring that out, it costs a lot of money and we're pricing. I'm, I'm afraid we're going to price a lot of really good, really compassionate, real, you know, pet owners that, um, they're responsible pet owners. They just can't afford us for the things that we can do, but maybe we want to do. I mean, we can do so much more than we used to be able to do. I mean, when I started, what, we had two antibiotics and a steroid. I mean, that's, <laughs> and a three by five card was their entire patient record. I mean, we didn't have that much. And so we can do so much more, which is awesome. Um, but we're going to leave a lot of people that aren't going to be able to come into our doors. And I think that's something for the future we need to address um, is access to care. So, so and um, I'm going to jump in there. That group. I'm going to jump in there, Gary, and access to care. And, and you've, you've brought us down a different rabbit hole is in terms of paying for that service. Yet at the same point, a lot of vet students, that, and, and I'm totally making a generalization here, a lot of vet students coming out of the schools where we have veterinary hospitals in place, they're only seeing the gold standard. They're only seeing that as being the only way. Everything needs to be referred. So therefore this gold standard, now I'm using a quotation, is the only way to practice veterinary medicine. So we have a place where we are raising our fees. We have multiple business owners in this conversation. We need to raise our business fees because our costs are going up. We want to pay more. And yet as a result of that, that negative spin flywheel, whatever you want to call it, kicks into play. Anybody want to take a stab at that? Because this can only go one of two ways. I'm going to go Steph, and then I'll jump to Kent, Jordan, and Craig. Okay. So we have the solution in front of us, right? So the access to care, pricing ourselves out of um, being able to offer this stuff. We have like a whole bunch of RBTs in our clinic because we've been maxing out their tech skills, but they want to run their own appointment books. Like they want to see it clients all day. So if we gave them a whole day of wellness appointments, they could do that if they were allowed. Yep. And I definitely think they'd be able, especially with like a little bit more, you know, this is how you make sure you do this and that, whatever it is. But then you could also price things the same as they have been, maybe a little bit less. Yep. You can still pay them more. Like it's, it's all right in front of us, right? It's, it's using these these RBTs for what they can actually do. And then the fewer and fewer vets that there are out there then can get into doing like truly things that vets need to do. Excellent. And so building proper support teams, allowing them to administer yeah. wellness, all those things that Craig alluded to earlier that are within their scope of practice. Kent, jump in there where you can. Thanks, Steph. Oh man, I, I don't know if I can like actually bring my thoughts together <laughs> on a lot of this. Uh, 
yeah, I don't know. I, honestly, yeah. I think that here, here's, here's where my, my brain goes. So the, the three things that like, I don't want to become dentists. I really don't want to be the dentists because I feel like when you go to the dentist, you get this huge bill and you're like, did the dentist touch my mouth? Like, I don't, I don't remember that part happening. And so I want to be caution. I want to caution the veterinary world that we don't, I love what you're saying, Steph. Like I really do, but I just don't want to turn into this, like, oh yeah, the doctor came in and gave my two needles and it was still $97 or it was still $105. And so like, I just don't want to turn it. I just, I love the idea. I don't want to be seen that way because I think of dentists that way. And I don't like that dentist idea. And that goes into like insurance, which is a whole other thing that I don't really want to talk about because I think that's taking us down that same road. Um, I, I guess what's, yeah, the whole idea of this glass castle at, the, at, at your vet schools, I, the thing I keep saying, and Jordan, I mean, I, you're, you're in that glass castle and I hope that you are bringing some realism to that glass castle. Um, like I'm sure you're very capable of F-bombs and all. Uh, <laughs> I, I think it's a simple fix to that glass castle. Honestly, I think every case that gets presented, you give a budget to. You're like, okay, here's a sick cat. You have $150, fix it. That, I think that's a simple fix, honestly. Like, cause yes, you should know about the gold standard. But not everybody can afford the gold standard. So I really think that that would be a very simple change is that you give a budget for each each case. Um, but yeah, I, I guess a lot of things like make me jump about what we just said. And I, I honestly, my brain is like too full with too many ideas to like quite properly verbalize it. So that's my small attempt at doing it. So thank you, Kent. Steph, in quick response, and yeah. Jordan. Yeah, just a quick response on that, because I wasn't necessarily saying that like the vet would pop in then and be like, oh, hey, here I am. Um, it would literally be like the client would go in expecting to see an RVT. They're consenting to see an RVT. They're well aware that that's what they're seeing. This is the price to see an RVT. So everyone's happy, right? You set the expectation. So that's more what I was getting at, right? It's not just that it's like a show and then the vet pops in for two seconds. But yeah. Saw the nods across everybody's. That's perfect. Jordan, let's go to you our, our sole academic in the room this evening. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I too have a big problem with people graduating, feeling like quote unquote gold standard is the only way to practice. Um, I think that we do need to give students opportunities to see uh, how we can practice with, you know, without a CT, without an MRI, without 24 hour hospitalization, uh, with 24 hour round the clock care, right? All of those things. How do we do that when we can't spend $1,200 on a parvo puppy, right? Like, um, and so I, I honestly, for me, it always comes back to what are the opportunities we can give students to see these things in the real world? And so some of that is ensuring that students get time in private practices to see what the real world looks like. But some of that also is expanding into how do we get students engaged in outreach and engagement in serving populations that don't regularly have access to veterinary care, because for certain in those situations, budgets are going to be limited. Um, and, you know, resources are going to be limited, uh, access to technology is going to be limited in some cases, right? Like when I go up to Northern Saskatchewan, I don't even have a friggin' x-ray machine. Yeah. So do I have to diagnose a broken leg without it? Yeah, I definitely do, right? Um, do we have to diagnose lymphoma to the best of our ability with a fine needle aspirate and a microscope? Hell yeah, we do. Um, and so, you know, these are the things that I think students need to get experience with. And so for me, there's a huge place for veterinary colleges to partner with industry, you know, whether that's veterinary industry or other, right? Um, resource extraction is a big one in the North um, and to, to sort of access funds that are available for community health um, to improve animal health as a conduit to that. And at the same time, provide veterinary learners with experience in providing care outside of the glass castle because I really think that that's a fabulous opportunity for instilling in them these skills that have to do with social accountability and how we expand as a veterinary profession and how we do all of these things to ensure that we are upholding our oath, but while also, um, you know, making sure that people have access to care for goodness sakes. So who leads that Jordan? We're going to go to Craig next and, and this for the group as well. Who leads that? Is that corporate medicine? Is that academia that's got their own views? Is that uh, government? Who does that? 
Because that costs money, that that costs time, that costs students resources that would be otherwise directed towards doing their academics or, you know, paying for a summer job. Yeah. So I think personally, so never in a million years would I ask students to pay for these things, right? Um, I think that from my perspective, there's a huge role for government. Because again, I think that as veterinary professionals, we need to do a much better job of talking about ourselves as public health professionals, because that's what we freaking are, right? Um, And so I think that that there's a huge role for government. And that's one of the things that I really want to do more of is lobbying government to like hand over some dang cash for you know, improving community health through animal health. Um, And I think that veterinary colleges have a huge role here and industry does too. I think that corporate does have a role too. And I, you know, I'm looking at Craig and and the conversations that we had with an organization around DEI earlier in in the year. Um, And I think that, you know, there is a role for corporate here. I think corporate does have some philanthropy dollars available to do some of these things. Um, And so I think that there can be a lot of great partnerships there. I don't think that it's a one Yep. one awesome. tier solution. I think that there are many different uh, hands in the pot for Burbilly. Thank you. Craig, Tanisha, we're going to the next question. Gary, quickly. It, uh, so I, do I have a minute to talk on this point? Yes. Okay. So the only thing I want to say about this point on access to care and sort of, um, you know, the vet schools having a responsibility to teach students about spectrum of care and that that's okay. It's not really even just the vet schools it's us like it is like we are to blame for this problem because at the end of the day our graduates will come out and they're afraid not to do a diagnostic or not to do a test for fear that they get called in front of the state board in which case they're going to be judged by their peers and their peers are awful hard on them like I would be very 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 comfortable doing a physical exam on a dog feeling a large abdominal mass and telling the owners your dog has a large abdominal mass. I don't need to do a CT to tell them that. I don't need to do an ultrasound to tell them that. And if they don't have the financial resources and the wherewithal to go forward, I'll be very comfortable in speaking with them through euthanasia on that patient because that's what they can do. But a colleague of mine might look at me and say, oh my God, Craig, you didn't confirm. What if that was just a benign splenic mass and we could have taken it out? Well, what if we could have? The owners couldn't have afforded it anyway and they didn't want to go that route why you know but you get judged and as a vet who's been practicing for a really long time and you know i practiced when we didn't have access to ultrasound and ct and all these other things i had to make decisions like that but when i talk about it now to some of my younger peers they look at me like what are you talking about that's terrible like i had a surgeon arguing with me that it was standard of care to do a ct before any exploratory laparotomy I was like, are you kidding? (laughs) What? But, you know, so I think that we can be our own worst enemy because, listen, at the end of the day, we all want to practice excellent quality medicine every single time. But I think we also have to recognize there is actually amazing quality medicine that we can practice that doesn't require a CT, that doesn't require an MRI, that doesn't require 15,000 diagnostic tests. Our eyes, our hands, they're pretty darn good. And good old stethoscope, you can do a lot, I think. But I'm old. Thank you, Craig. Appreciate your perspective and the addition into what Jordan had previously said. Tanisha, Gary, Tanisha first. So one thing I want to say, my favorite thing when students visit me in the ER is like, vomiting, diarrhea, dog, what do you want to do? They give me the list, everything. And I said, great, you have $200. What are you going to do now? Because that's the reality of life. So what I think needs to happen is those of us who are comfortable in practice, who have learned a lot, who believe that everyone needs access to care and we have to work within budgets and communication really is key. Like Craig, I understand what you're saying about people being concerned about being sued, but I've served on like ethics and grievances committee. It's lack of communication that causes those things to to happen. So if people know you're working with limited information and you are still trying to help them, I think that you don't get sued. And that's what students in the younger generation needs to understand. Um, So what it takes is actually veterinarians who are in practice, who understand this, who love what they're doing still to educate and to interact. And I think that there is a power in social media, in externships, in interacting with students in, in the younger generation to do that. I think they have really great ideas 
and Jonathan and Michael and I have talked about this about like salary expectations after graduation and things like that. But like, where is the skill set and the values? But what it takes is those of us who have been in practice who get it and have been successful, then saying, let me help you, let me guide you, let me mentor you, um, and I can learn from you also. And I think that's what's going to actually affect change versus us talking about it, but not actually reaching out and being a part of the community and making a difference. I get that the governing bodies take a long time. That's why I struggle with dealing with the AVMA and with my local VMA. Because yeah, and just I just gonna add on, sorry to that, Tanisha, um, your comment when I said that they were it, it is fear of being um, going under litigation because if you actually look at the cases and the people who actually get disciplined, you have to do some really bad stuff in veterinary medicine, and you know, it, like ninety percent of the complaints that get lodged are dismissed. So that's what I think students have to understand. And helping vets through this, I've told them that I'm like, you guys realize that ninety percent of these never ever go to discipline and but yet they're so fearful of it which you know I feel like hey if you did get like you said good communication explain it to the owners good documentation so, so yeah two quick points on this the first is Craig's the first one to step in tonight so he's getting muted for the rest of the conversation that was great we lasted 45 minutes that was fantastic Tanisha, you brought up the point of communication, which is so important in this day and age. I'm surprised it took us 45 minutes, and especially in this terms of the future of veterinary medicine and what does communication look like, both in the workplace, with our vet students, in academia. Such an important, valid point. I think that was only going to become more important or else people outside of our industry are going to come and dominate us. Gary, you get to finish off on this point. Anything to add from any of those points in terms of the, the future and discussion? Yeah, the uh, the point I wanted to make, and Tanasia finally brought up the word I was just dying because I knew she would, is um, I think all this stuff, as far as wrapping around access to care, glass castle, which is a cool term in America, we use uh, ivory tower. So I like that. And um, is mentorship. Mm. I mean, those, like Tanasia said, as far as those that give a shit, excuse me, go those that, that really care, it passing that on to those to like show them that in the glass castle or whatever and then they come to my practice because I'm an adjunct professor at Washington State University so we have students come through and it's like yeah you can get a cysto without an ultrasound on a cat you can get a urine sample you can induce anesthesia without a catheter you know it's like oh there's probably a lot of listeners that say what the hell how that's that's sacrilege you can't do that but it can happen and we can show those alternatives and things that we've been doing for years and animals survive we don't get sued and patients have great outcomes um and there's just all these different levels so i think if we those of us that care that have some experience give that back in mentorship um i'm really really excited about the future love it great way to finish off this segment the future is really looking positive and I love all the different ideas and rabbit holes that we could have gone down for the next three hours. We are going long here. We're going to spend the next 10 minutes because I think this last segment is also very important for our listeners. There's been a lot of people on the Veterinary Project podcast that have taken different journeys and roads in their careers whether it's been the last two years since they graduated, amazing people already graduated and going on to new things and or have been in the profession 30 years plus. Love to spend the next 10 minutes or so discussing how we as a single individual and or as a group can make a difference in veterinary medicine. Because there's a lot of listeners out there that might be stuck and are looking for that next big thing and or are already part of a small community that don't realize how much of a difference they're making. Who wants to jump down this road? Because all of us in this room, all eight of us, are going about it sometimes in the same way, sometimes in different ways. Would love to hear perspectives. Let's go there. Jordan, your hand was first up. Let's go there. Oh, I think Gary put his up first, but I'll take it. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I one of the things that I always um, tell folks who ask this question, right? Like, how do we do something that makes us feel like we're making a difference? Because I think as 
veterinary professionals, we're, we all got into this to, to be helpers, right? To try and make a difference in some way or the other. Um, and so, you know, would people want to make uh, some sort of a lasting mark or do something that's going to, to change the way that veterinary medicine rolls out um, you know, I think that we do make a difference every day in the things that we do in the individual pet's life, in the individual family's life, in the individual, you know, producer's life, whatever it happens to be. Um, I think that when people are thinking about what they could do differently, what they could do to, to sort of, you know, push the envelope a little bit, um, it's, I think, finding the things that make you excited, like those things that really light you up and make you like stoked. And when people can just hear it in your voice that you're real excited about that thing, like that's the shit you do, man. That's the stuff you spend your career on. Because when those things, like when your heart rate goes up and when you get flushed to the face and when there's all these endorphins running through your veins, just even thinking and talking about that thing, that's what you do. And that's how you'll make a difference because where there's passion, there's change usually, right? If you've got a passion for something that means that you're going to push it and you're going to make it better and you're going to optimize it. Um, and so I think from my perspective, that's, that's how people make a difference. Two thumbs up and a clap from this guy. Anybody want to try something different there? Cause that was amazing perspective, Jordan. Thank you. Passion, get the heart bigger, go for it. Gary first hand up i'm talking too much but i'll try to be quick but um back in 1989 when i graduated and in school in the 80s um we were a class that was pretty much 50 50 men and women that's definitely changed now um men are not as frequent now but still at that time men were the vast majority of the profession and I think still, even in leadership, people would say that there's too many men in charge in leadership today, but that's really, really changing. It's really changing dramatic, dramatically over the last six or seven years. Um, here in this crowd, we're all really, really white. And I'd love, to, uh, I'd love to see that change. And that's one thing I think where we can make a difference, where we can reach out, get outside our comfort zone and really, um, you know, kind of push it a little bit and be awkward. And we're going to screw up when we try to do that. But I think we do need to be intentional in inviting those that haven't had a seat at the table to the table and see what happens. Some people are going to be offended. We're going to mess up and do the wrong thing when we do that, but keep doing it and we'll figure it out. And that's kind of a change that I would like to see coming is that we don't all look the same as we go forward over the next, uh, next generation in this profession, because that diversity will really, really improve us, change us, make us better. That's all I got. No, oh, that's fantastic. And, and that awkwardness and yet reaching out and individuals doing that then leads to the whole, leads to other people feeling more comfortable. And before you know it, you've got a movement. Uh, Mike, I'm going to reach up into the corner. We went from the guy that was talking the most, perhaps on his own accord, I don't think so, to the guy that's maybe perhaps spoken the less. What do you think, Mike? How does an individual make a difference? Well, or a group? spoken the less if you're the whatever eighth dumbest person in the room you just shut up and listen so that that's what i was was doing so i mean this is a good question i have i have lots of thoughts on it um i think you you have to take an individual responsibility but a collective view so what i mean by that is like at the end of the day when you go home and look in the mirror can can you look in the mirror and say i did what i can do and you you kind of have to stop worrying sometimes what others are doing, you know, if they're not doing what you would do um, and trust the process that if you keep showing up, um, cause I think perhaps, you know, our training, we get immediate gratification, like immediate, immediate test results. Four years later, you're a vet life takes a lot longer. And so some of these huge changes that we're working on, you're going to be putting in effort for a long time. And on a short scale, it's going to feel like you're getting nowhere. But then when you take a step back and look at a body of work, you're going to be pretty proud of what you've accomplished. So, you know, I think like that's the whole point of, of these conversations, you know, is getting people together and start going in the same direction. And one, one last thing, it's kind of come through this conversation that speaks to me a lot is around environment. So we like mentorship could be the same thing. Uh, when Jordan talks about passion is you have to get yourself in those environments that are going to support your passion so you can get going. Cause you're, 
you're not going to outperform a bad habit, right? Like, or, or a bad environment, sorry. You know, if you're in the wrong spot and no one is supporting you, you're going to have to pivot. And we see that in, in lots of our guests. So I don't know, I'm just sitting back and taking it in, but those are some thoughts that I have. Those are some amazing thoughts with lots of head nods all around the group here. I get, I get active when I'm going. Love the wisdom, love the insight. Uh, who wants to take another crack at this? Craig. I'm sorry. I thought I was maybe supposed to stay on mute, but <laughs> I, uh, I let you, know you back Listen, in. I, I just have to say, like, I think everybody has said so many really profound things in this, but I think the things, two things that probably resonated with me the most about making a difference are the passion piece. Like I think as veterinarians, we have such an opportunity to do so many diverse things within this profession. And I feel like too many people are afraid to make the changes when they're stagnant. And then that just leads to that burnout and that dissatisfaction. And sometimes it's just like, you know what, follow your passion, go for it, take a chance. It's scary, trust me. I mean, I've made lots of changes and it's scary, but you do it and you, you're happy. The other thing I think that really stuck out and Steph, you know, you were the one who first brought this up, made a really profound comment that really stuck with me is respecting the diversity of opinions with this in, within this profession, the diversity of ways that we might wanna practice, the diversity in the way and the, and the types of clients that we may see. I think that's a really big piece is just acknowledging that this is diverse and that we can do things differently and that it's okay to have different opinions. We can agree to disagree at the end of the day, that's okay. Um, but you know, that, so those are the two things that really, you know, I would say that, you know, if someone looking forward, be okay, be open, listen to other people, hear what they have to say, because there is a lot of wisdom in what other people will suggest to you Excellent. and be curious, stay curious. If there's one thing I can tell everybody, stay curious, it's the best thing. Excellent. With that, I'm curious Tanisha raise her voice, raise her hand, additional points person, group, Tanisha, you're in the middle of this on the social media side. What does it look like from your perspective? I, I just want to say it's exciting. It's exciting that we have people who have been out in practice for so long and they all have taken different paths and we all have found kind of our joy in the profession and we're still discovering like our limits and what we can do. And so I hope that people that listen to this episode are just kind of inspired to keep trying to find what works for them and realize how many options are out there. And I think most of us are pretty open to being uh, communicated with. And I am always like, reach out to me if you have questions, if you're struggling, because a lot of people are really struggling right now. But I'm hoping that this episode kind of shows that you can be in practice for a long time as a veterinarian and still really love what you're doing, whether you're practicing in the hospital or you're not. Um, but I just, I don't know. My heart feels full right now and I'm happy. It could be the wine, but I think it's the company more than anything else. So. <laughs> <laughs> that is great. <laughs> Steph, I think you raise your hand. You may not have, but I'm putting you on the spot anyway. Anything to no. add from a person, a group, making a difference in veterinary medicine, whatever that looks like. Yeah, so I had like a lot of my thoughts were mirrored in, in what you guys said. And I think if I had to think of like, one word or like one thing to focus on it's that like you know kind of individual self-awareness um you know i'm i'm really passionate about creating a workplace where 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 it is a safe environment for people to come and and be who they are and speak speak freely but you know one big thing that i learned this year was that that really they all come to the table at different stages of maybe openness or like learning about themselves and and it's like how can we also support that right so it's just kind of creating a safe environment and you know really safe workplaces so that basically people can come to heal whether it's from you know maybe their past vet clinic they worked at but but maybe just from like their lived experiences right from being a young child or whatever it is and that they can come and they can heal and there's this open environment there's resources available I think and dig into that kind of self-awareness piece and that reflection on on what you're learning about and the, the problem is is that often that is uncomfortable like you were saying Craig right and like and, and and that's something that I see that I think is like one of the hardest things is just when people are so uncomfortable being uncomfortable so it's just kind of really digging into that and expecting it to be uncomfortable and then basically it's like okay it's this is going to be uncomfortable and then, and then it'll be better. So just really digging into that and that 
reflective reflective thinking the self-awareness just so you can live in alignment like you were saying Jordan with like that you know like just really figure out your passion and live in alignment with with your values and and then you can draw your boundaries too right and then it's a lot easier to like hold up your boundaries because it's like hey that's great you want me to do that but but I'm not going to and then that becomes easier as well so I think 2021 was a lot of like we need boundaries we need this and blah and then 2022 will be like okay well let's just kind of start putting these things in order um that's kind of yeah how I'd summarize last year and hopefully the year coming up is that we'll start to see a lot more of um yeah kind of things coming together I guess is what I'd like to say yeah Steph, as someone, uh, uh, amazing insights and someone that's watched yours and Dave's journey uh, and yours own in particular, as you moved away from a practicing veterinarian, uh, you, you are, your action has completely directed what you've just spoken about. And for anybody that's looking for somebody to follow in terms of change management, finding themselves as an individual boundaries, family life, all the rest of it, perfect example of that in the workplace being veterinary medicine. Amazing. So yeah, fantastic. Kent, we haven't heard from you at all this evening in this regards to an individual person, a business change in veterinary medicine of which you have participated at, at whole different levels. What does this look like from your perspective? Yeah, uh, thanks for asking that, Jonathan. I think that uh, for me, as I sit here and reflect, and this is a a question I've been thinking about since the beginning, actually, because I wasn't really sure, but it's kind of funny how throughout the episode, it's kind of like made me realize uh, what I am doing and, and what my focus is. And I think it kind of takes what what Steph has said and what Jordan has said, and also touches a little bit on what Craig was saying there recently. Um, and something I learned from my church days, if you can believe it, um, uh, and maybe through like my more recent church days, which was actually like losing the church. That's a whole other story. Sorry, I should, that, that would be a different rabbit hole completely. Um, but essentially, you know, I, I remember sitting around a table one day um, and somebody saying, whose voice is not at the table? And I so I think for me, um, the way to make a difference is when you're trying to implement difference is to think this is my voice that I'm hearing. And I might share that with the person at the desk beside me, but who on my staff, who, who in the association, who in my province might share a different opinion than me and how would they want me to approach this subject? And maybe I don't use their, maybe I don't use their approach to it, but I want to at least consider the way they might approach this, this change sort of thing. And so I think that's been a really, a really helpful thing for me um, is to repeat that to myself. Okay, here's my plan for implementing our new COVID restrictions. Whose voice am I not hearing in implementing these? Who, who you know, that, whose voice is so different from mine or who's the extreme opposite of me yeah. on this topic? Um, and I think for me, that's been really, really meaningful from, from, a, from a practice point of view from a sitting around with my friends, having a beer, talking about why the roads haven't been plowed. <laughs> you know, like it, it goes everywhere. Like who's, whose voice is not being heard in this? So I think, I think for me, that's really uh, to make change. That's, what, that's what's been, been uh, instrumental for me. As the person that's narrating or, or ensuring conversation goes, I'm going to put you on the spot, Kent, because I think that's such a valid point and one that, that's a, uh, uh, um, different than any of the other views in terms of uh, an amazing perspective. How do you do that? How do you do that specifically in your clinic, if I may, when you're having either a team meeting or a discussion on a process forward, just for our listeners from a tactical standpoint, how, cause that's so insightful. Yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. Um, uh, Beer talking, but it's true. Yeah. Right. I mean, honestly, I, I, in some respects, I, I'm like in some ways shy to answer that question a little bit because I think, um, I always feel a bit weird about those questions because if my staff is listening, they're probably like, oh yeah, sure. Sure, he thinks in my opinion. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, you're asking for my advice on something that like, I don't know if I actually do well. Like, I don't know if I'm good at this or not. Um, But I think where I, where I really, where I really notice uh, it or what I've tried to do is, so typically when I'm making a plan out, it used to be, it would just vary on the top of my head. Um, It was just like spur of the moment. I'd be like, here's what we're doing. Now I try and stop, sit down, write out my plan, type out my plan, read through it and go, okay, what would this doctor think about this statement? You know what? They probably wouldn't really love this. What would this technician think about 
this? How would this make this untechnician uncomfortable? And like I say, I, I don't necessarily change it, but I just want to make sure that I'm not doing things. So it, I really use it when I'm making changes at the clinic or making implementing change at, at the clinic level. And that's probably where I've implemented this in my life the that's most, awesome. but I think writing it down has been the most, the most helpful thing for me because yeah, often when you just have these thoughts rolling around in your head, you're not capable of looking at an individual part of it that says, Oh, you know what? Jordan would actually be very uncomfortable with this. Cause in my brain, I'm like, Oh yeah, this is a great idea. It's amazing. You know? Um, but until you see it in writing or see it somehow visually, you're not able to like actually analyze it appropriately. So that would be like a slight tactical thing. I don't know. Maybe Steph, I think maybe Steph probably has some ideas on that. Cause I think you've practiced that a bit more maybe. Yeah, like I would say, you know, actually just ask, right? Be like, this is what this is what we want to do. How do you guys see us doing this? So it's that like, you know, yeah, kind of as a leader, you're saying what you're doing and then you're kind of asking them, wow. how do you guys see us being able to make this happen? And um, and yeah, like exactly like you were saying, Kent, like just the, the perspectives that that brings out, like, like I would never be able to come up with the stuff that they come up with and really at the end of the day that's what matters because you want it to actually work for them so I mean like and like this is something I probably only started doing this this year I think because before this year for sure I was I was like this is what we're doing I I, I came up with this brilliant plan it's brilliant and it's gonna work so great and then it's just like and then when it doesn't work I'm like what's wrong you know and then it's like oh it's because like it doesn't work for them I don't know I didn't ask them so that's um yeah, it's that like, this is what I want to do. How do you guys see us like making this happen? And that's been a big, a big game changer in our clinic for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I would say that that's exactly, um, you know, sometimes when I, when I write it all out and I find these things that I'm like, this could be controversial. I'm going to take it to the person that I think might have a problem with it or, or the people that maybe this doesn't sit well. Cause I know probably who's going to agree with it. Cause I know the people well enough in my clinic, but you know, maybe I don't take it to the whole staff. Cause sometimes it's like a bit overwhelming to have 40 opinions on it but if it's like three people that i know this might not sit well with i'm going to get their opinion on it anyways so mm -hmm. get their perspective that's good advice tactics for our listeners this evening we are over time we were trying not to go over time but we did so that's how this works when you get eight amazing individuals together before we close off the evening anybody have any comments in closing Jordan. I just want to say that one of the things that really stood out for me uh, in this conversation and that I appreciated so much was the discussion of how we optimize the, the skills of our RBTs. Mm. Um, I think that's such an, uh, an important conversation and not only when we're talking about access to care, but also when we're talking about efficiency um, and also how we train our veterinary learners too. Uh, if we train them to understand that, uh, you know, a, a large portion of their mentorship is going to come from RBTs, um, the better that's going to go when they head out into practice. So I really appreciated that. Thank you for sharing. Yep. For myself, it is uh, humbling to have seven individuals in front of me right now that I so much respect that come from such varied areas within veterinary medicine. And for all of us, I believe on this panel or this, this discussion, this inaugural event have the same like in mind and that is both the current state of veterinary medicine and the squiggly marks that Steph discussed earlier this evening and yet are still so positive on what is possible within our profession utilizing the amazing teams we have client service perspective all the very niches that you can go into and the different uh, business avenues that equal uh, career options success opportunity for everybody that is looking to really um, make this a career that they can be proud of and make a difference in. So on that note, I do want to bring a toast forward for those that uh, still have a drink in their hands. A cheers to our inaugural event. Thank you on behalf of Mike and I this evening for making this happen. For those listeners that are still listening, thank you for coming along for the journey that is 2021 to a better 2022 when we talk COVID style and to continue to make an impact in veterinary medicine. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Cheers.
Thank you for listening to the Veterinary Project Podcast. As a recap, on behalf of our hosts, the Veterinary Project Podcast will be releasing new episodes weekly. So be sure to tune in as we bring you more conversations aimed at helping you enjoy a life well lived. If you enjoyed what you heard on the show and you want to stay in the know, please like, love, and or subscribe to the podcast on the listening platform of your choosing, as we're available on all the usual suspects. If you know of others that may benefit from these conversations, we'd love it if you please share the show with them, as this will help us grow our community to reach more and more veterinary professionals. Speaking of which, if you are a veterinary professional and would like to get connected with more like-minded individuals who are joining us on this journey, please send an email to the Veterinary Project Podcast at gmail.com, and we'll invite you to be a part of our private Facebook group. General feedback, requests for information, or perhaps requests to be a guest on the show can also be sent to the Veterinary Project Podcast at gmail.com. Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light, thank you for listening to the show, and we'll catch you again next week for another episode of the Veterinary Project Podcast. Bye for now. Bye for now.